Well, thank you very much, and um, very, very briefly to uh, thank the Friends of the Bosnian um, for inviting me to give this talk, and indeed the Bosnian itself, and above all its publishing division, um, for asking me um, to write this book, um, which has been an enormous pleasure. I've known these buildings for longer than I like to think, um, and it's been absolutely fascinating to go once more into the details of how they were built and how gradually you have this collection of university buildings, which to my mind is unmatched, um, let's say anywhere in the world for historical and architectural um, interest. Um, Oxford, as you all know, is the third European university to be founded, um, or in the words of the, uh, Sir Richard Southern, um, to emerge because there was never a founding date. Um, and when it began in the late 12th century, it had no buildings of its own. It was based in the university church and later expanded um, over the lands to the north, as you can see um, on the image that you should be able to see on your screens at the moment. Students lived in private houses, um, some of which became academic halls, which were licensed lodging houses. Um, and it wasn't really until the 13th century that the first colleges um, emerged, um, which were of course endowed and independent, but relatively small um, at first. So the whole thing starts really with the university church, which we see here, and with the um, building to the side of it, which now houses um, the cafe. And I wonder how many people who go into the cafe there realize um, that that was in fact the first meeting place of the university um, staff, um, teaching, faculty, and so on. And then above that um, was the first library of the university. And now this building wasn't actually built until the early 14th century, and it's remarkably um, well preserved. It's probably um, the oldest surviving university building in regular use um, in, in Europe. So <clears throat> where were the students actually taught? Um, well, they were partly taught in the university church, um, but um, in the in the um, 14th century, a, a set of rooms were built um, by Osney Abbey, which was one of the two big landowners in medieval and central Oxford um, to contain schools. Schools, of course, mean lecture rooms. And we have a picture of the Osney schools, which you can see on your left, by um, there was whether it was drawn or put in the book by, I don't know, um, Ralph Beerblock, who was a fellow of St. John's. Um, and he brought out these pictures with little verses about them um, in 1566 published by a man called John Agus. Um, and those schools, as you can see in the image on the right, um, formed a kind of L shape with um, the Divinity School, which we will go on to in a minute. So there you have the first um, teaching rooms for the university, the first, I should say, the first dedicated teaching rooms to the university. But the first building of any size or grandeur is the one which we see on our screens now. And that's the Divinity School. It's the oldest lecture room um, in the university. And what's particularly amazing is it's still used. It's where you go um, to put on your robes when you go in to receive a degree in the Sheldonian. Um, and um, it was uh, intended originally for teaching um, of people who were attached to one of the three higher faculties of the university, which were divinity, law um, and medicine. 
and those were the only subjects in which you could get a doctorate. So people who wanted a doctorate um, in divinity would actually be taught um, in this room. There would be um, disputations there, which were kind of structured um, the question and answer sessions, which led to a degree before you had written degrees. Um, and the fittings at the far ends on the upper image were originally for people attending those disputations, um, which actually went on right until the 18th century. Now above there um, was the university's, not the university's first library, it was the university's second library. The first library was the room above the what's now the um, Vaults and Garden Cafe, um, but that was superseded um, by the present um, library, which was built <coughs> basically to contain books from a donation by Duke Humphrey, the younger brother of Henry V. The books were arranged in the way that um, books in all medieval libraries were arranged. They were on shelves, they were chained to the shelves, and you would lift them up and put them on a lectern and stand to read them. Remember, they're all manuscript books at first. Um, and so that was the first library above the Divinity School with its absolutely magnificent Leon Vault, um, which is a work of art of the highest order. And that all survives. So um, we can see that um, in the, uh, the, the Agas, Ralph Agas view that I showed you before, um, at the bottom of this image, um, just inside the northern city wall, um, with the Osney schools at right angles to it. Um, and if you look to the left of that, you'll see um, a collection of houses um, leading up to the, or down if you prefer, um, to the University Church. You can see All Souls College on the left, and you can see Brazenose um, to the right of that area. That is what became Radcliffe Square. But it was a long time before Radcliffe Square emerged, and before that emerged, um, the library went through huge vicissitudes. Um, basically, after the Reformation, um, most of the books were, were thrown out um, because they were regarded as popish and misleading. Um, the library was um, pretty much made desolate. Um, and if it weren't for the gentleman we see on the left here, um, Sir Thomas Bodley, um, it's very difficult to know what would have happened. Um, and he's rightly remembered um, as one of the great um, patrons of literature and the arts of the Elizabethan era, but more specifically as one of the makers of Oxford as we know it today. He refounded the library in 1598 within the um, desolate old 15th century room. He had an interesting career. He went abroad to Geneva, um, 1555. That's the place to go if you were a um, zealous Protestant. Um, and later became a fellow of Merton College and lecturer in Greek there. Then he traveled beyond the seas in 1576 to 80, served as a diplomat, married a rich widow in 1586 and inherited her fortunes, which it used to be said, and it may well be true, were derived from fishing for pilchards in Devon. Um, and um, he used his, that wealth to refound the library. And when you look at um, the Duke Humphrey's library now, you're looking at Bodley's shelves, Bodley's roof actually, which had to be pretty much replaced um, with the paintings on that. 
he also paid for an eastward extension of the library, um, which is what we now call the Arts End. Um, and the reason for that is that during Queen Elizabeth's reign, the number of students in Oxford doubled, especially sons of gentry and um, members of what you might call the middling sort of people who wanted to educate their children properly um, with a liberal education. Many of those people um, were fee-paying commoners um, who um, accounted for the big expansion of a lot of the colleges at that time, and they left without taking degrees. And the numbers of these people continued to rise through the early 17th century and peaked in the 1630s. So Arts End was intended to house the books for the liberal arts, which were what you studied for your BA and MA. And then theology and the higher faculties um, would be in the old library beyond which we saw in the previous image. One of the things that's very interesting about this set of buildings is the facade that I'm showing you on the right, because if you look at that superficially, you'd say, well, that was built in the Middle Ages. It wasn't. It was built in 1610, um, when we think of architecture becoming more classical. So why this discrepancy? Well, the reason is, I'm convinced, that um, Bodley and his friend um, William Saville, the um, warden of Merton College, wanted to emphasise continuity between the new library and the old Oxford. This was um, part of the same um, institution. But... Um, he also added to, or Bodley also added to the arts end, um, in, in a really amazing um, uh, set of buildings, which are what we now call the body and quad, or the school's quadrangle. Um, and without labouring the point too much, um, it's just worth mentioning, if you look at the right-hand image of the ground plan, that you had separate rooms or schools for teaching all the subjects in the curriculum, um, which was basically the medieval curriculum with some extra subjects added, such as natural philosophy, i.e. science, and so on and so forth. And so lectures would take place in those um, rooms. Um, and this is part of a programme, basically, by the university to, um, to, to organise um, a better system of lecturing, in addition to the tutorial system, which was already um, going strong within the university. So you went to lectures and went to tutorials. Now, if you look at the um, lower image on the left, you'll see that that um, building, that quadrangle, also is very medieval in style. There's no indication whatsoever of the changes that were overcoming architecture at the side. And that building um, extends, of course, right up to Cat Street on the, on the right. Um, Anthony Wood, the great historian of 17th century Oxford, tells us that the sages of the university considered among themselves that the adding of three more sides to the arts end would make a complete quadrang quadrangular pile wherein the schools of the superior and inferior arts, as also languages, might be continued. So the building embodies the 17th century idea of what a liberal education is. And Bodley also left money to turn the top floor into what he saw as, quote, a very large supplement for the stowage of books. Um, now, in fact, there weren't enough books at first, so that became a picture gallery, as we will see.
So here's the body and quad, or school's quad from inside, and the medieval feeling continues inside. But if you look at the tower, there's something else going on here. And what is going on, broadly speaking, is that um, the tower is being used to, um, to as a statement of what classical as opposed to medieval architecture is all about. Um, it's about um, the classical orders of architecture descended from the Greeks and the Romans. So um, Doric in two forms, then Ionic, and then um, Corinthian in two forms. That's the five stories. Um, and that goes up to a room which at the top originally served as an observatory before the university got round to building a proper um, university. So all of this reminds us that the university is not only about teaching the humanities, it's about teaching the sciences as well. And it's not only about nostalgia for the Middle Ages, it's about um, trying to keep up with the new interest in the architecture of the ancient world. You may ask who actually designed this. Um, surprisingly, not by an Oxford Mason, not by an architect in the sense we would understand it, but by two um, Yorkshiremen who were persuaded to come down here to design it by the warden of Merton, Henry Savile, um, because the local Oxford Masons um, were charged too much. Um, and Savile and, and Bodley died in 1613. Savile wanted to get the building up as quickly as he could, and which he did within six years, um, with the help of those Masons. Just one little point um, to notice when you go in there next, which is the, um, the, the penultimate story with a statue of James I enthroned um, with um, figures on either side of him. Um, and he is supposed to have said, were I not a king, I would be a university man, and if it were so that I must be a prisoner, if I might, and if I might have my wish, if he were a prisoner, I would have no other prison than this library, and be chained together with those good authors. Well, that's a good motto um, for the friends of the Bodleian, I think. Um, it's an absolutely wonderful quotation. So the, looking at all that grandeur, let's actually look at what the schools or lecture rooms look like in their original form. And if you look at the left-hand image, you can see that they were highly functional and utilitarian. Um, there was a pulpit where the lecturer would stand. Everybody sat on benches around the side. Um, and it was really um, very plain. In other words, all the embellishment went, uh, went on, um, uh, on the outside of the building. But um, gradually, the schools were turned over to other uses. Um, so the ones on the ground floor, of course, mainly offices and the Bodleian shop now, um, on the first floor, um, the lower reading room, and the top floor, the upper reading room. It was a long time before that happened. Before then, they were used um, basically to store things. Um, and one thing that was stored in the bottom, where the shop is now, um, were statues from, um, <coughs> sorry, um, from um, the collection brought to England um, by Lord Arundel um, in the early 17th century, known as the Arundel Marbles, which you now see, of course, um, in, the, in the Ashmolean. Um, and then otherwise, um, those rooms were used for book storage. 
the upper eating room um, was, as I said, a gallery and very interesting. Um, the frieze, which was uncovered when it was restored um, in the uh, in, in the 1950s, um, shows um, important head, heads of important philosophers, divines and worthy people from the far past, inspired by a very similar frieze in the Uffizi in Florence. And they were taken from a book published by a Frenchman in 1584. Um, writers on the arts were in the North Range, medicine and law in the East Range, and theology on the other side. Then portraits were um, shown along the walls, as you can see in the bottom left image. Um, and there were also there was also what um, people loved in the 17th century, a cabinet of curiosities um, of various um, items, which included, according to John Evelyn, Joseph's party coloured coat. Well, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Um, a Muscovian lady's whip some Indian weapons, urns, lamps, etc. So the university got given all these things, didn't know where to put them. Let's put them up on the top floor of the, um, of the library, to which visitors were admitted um, almost from the beginning. It was something that people came to look at when they visited Oxford. The far end um, of, of the uh, Duke, original Duke Humphreys Library, you had an extension um, which was built in the 1630s, and that's what you see on the left of the um, top left image. And that's um, Selden Ends, um, which we see in the bottom image here, part of the library. And underneath that, um, a room that's um, shown to visitors on tours um, often, um, but otherwise you can't get into, um, and that's the Convocation House. Um, Convocation was the uh, main governing body of the university, and Archbishop Lord, who was very keen in the 1630s on reviving the university's traditions, um, were, were, was um, very much behind the revival of Convocation and said that it needed a better room for it to meet in, and that's the Convocation House, with this extraordinary fan vaulted vaulted ceiling which you would and superficially think, well, that was built in the 15th century. It actually wasn't. It was built in the 1750s, believe it or not, um, uh, above the, um, the, the, the Convocation House. And that's another sign of Oxford's ability to keep old traditions going. So we must move on. Um, the Civil War and the Restoration intervened. Um, and um, when the King came back, um, to the great um, pleasure of Oxford, which was royalist, of course, um, that return was celebrated by the Sheldonian Theatre, um, which was what um, it, it was equivalent to what's sometimes called the aula or great hall of a European university, um, which is a place which was used for um, degree giving um, and also for other um, uh, ceremonial purposes. Um, but there were other things too. Um, they um, printed Bibles in a printing house in the basement, and there was a shed next to it originally, um, where learned books were published. Um, the University Press really was revived um, by John Fell, um, Dean of Christchurch in the 1660s, and the press was originally right next door to that. The whole aim of this building was to echo um, the buildings of classical Rome, and if you look on the bottom right, you can see the Theatre of Marcellus, um, which the Sheldonian is loosely related to. Bear in mind that Christopher Wren, who designed this and was, of course, a graduate um, of Wadham College and then a Fellow of All Souls, had never been to Rome. He only knew these buildings from pictures. And the other thing to emphasise 
lies about the Sheldonian is that the really grand formal entrance is not facing Broad Street, but facing um, the Divinity School um, and Duke Humphreys. And that's what we see on the top right with a very elaborate display of the classical orders. And here, um, as you all know, we have the interior with its um, beautiful allegorical ceiling and its extraordinarily elaborate timber um, roof, um, which um, uh, is shown in a, a, a picture on the bottom right and was replaced um, in the early 19th century, but for its time it was quite a phenomenon, as was the allegorical painting by Robert Streeter, um, which is um, not unlike, let's say, um, Rubens' ceiling in the banqueting house in Whitehall, part of Whitehall Palace. And what that shows is um, learning, dispersing um, what uh, was called at the time brutish scoffing ignorance, which is those figures going down to hell um, from the bottom of the left hand image. Well, next to that, we have another um, very innovative building, um, which is the Ashmolean. And it's in innovative not so much for its architecture, um, but for what it was and what it stood for. It was a multi-purpose building. Um, the, um, the, the basement was used as a chemistry lab. The um, main floor was a lecture room that was later turned into the Natural History Museum, as we see in the bottom left image. And then the top floor um, was a museum. And the museum um, housed um, the rarities, as they were called, um, amassed by John Tredescant, son and um, father and son, who of course travelled in America, brought back all kinds of things um, like Powhatan's cloak that you can now see in the Ashmolean. They were all in the top floor of that. And that was another place that was open to the public and readily accessible, like the, um, the, the, the Bodleian uh, room that we saw. And here on the right, we have um, Elias Ashmole's um, very majestic portrait with this wonderful carved um, and gilded frame. <coughs> well, um, let's turn last to the development of the area between the Sheldonian and the um, University Church. And the first building that came there was the new printing house, as it was called. And that's because the press um, became very much more active in the later um, 17th century, not only for learned books, but also for Bibles, for what was to become the expanding empire, as well as the growing population um, of Britain. Um, so the idea was that the, um, the learned press and the Bible press would come together in one building, which would be built on the site of this higgledy-piggledy collection of houses that you can see on the right hand image. And a number of designs were produced for this, um, a lot of them by Christopher Wren's pupil, Nicholas Hawksmoor, an extremely able and original architect. And it was he who eventually designed the building as we see it today, um, with a very grand Doric portico, which symbolically, I think, marks the entrance not only to the printing house, which is basically a factory, but to the whole central area of the university, which is the subject I wrote about in my book. And it's an important part of that. It's like a kind of propyleum to um, a Greek temple. And um, again, it, you would approach it through a central um, passageway with the learned press to one side and the Bible press to the other and a rather beautiful room for the delegates to meet together. 
Well, Hawksmoor went on to produce um, a plan for the whole of the centre of Oxford. Amazingly ambitious, it was never going to be built, but parts of it were. And the part that is really um, important is the part between the Bosnian quadrangle and the University Church, which you can see in Hawksmoor's drawing and the, um, uh, the, the a revised version on the left, which you, is reproduced in my book. Um, the Forum Universitatis. Very interesting that they choose the word forum, um, a meeting place, a central gathering place. Um, and the way that that was built um, depend, depended hugely on one man whom we see here, um, John Radcliffe, um, immensely wealthy um, physician, ministered to Queen Anne and lots of the nobility, made lots of money and left it all to the university. Um, and his idea was to have a grand um, uh, building in the middle of this, um, uh, this area, which was before then um, occupied by ordinary houses, which had to be cleared before um, anything um, else could happen. And that's why um, the Radcliffe camera wasn't built until long after Radcliffe died. Um, on one side of this space, you have All Souls College, which was also, incidentally and importantly, being extended by none other than Nicholas Hawksmoor at the time that the plans for Radcliffe Square were first um, thought of. Um, the bust of Hawksmoor there on the left is in the Buttery of All Souls. And Hawksmoor produced several designs for this new library that was being envisaged. And we can see two of them here. Um, one of them um, was a, did, uh, a design to put it um, next to, um, to, to, to Selden End, and um, that's bottom left. The other was to attach it to the south wing range of the school's quadrangle, and that's the one that you see on your right here. So Hawksmoor did all these drawings, um, many of which are in the library of Worcester College, others belong to the Bodleian. And what you can see from the right hand one is that Hawksmoor was fascinated by the idea of a circular centrally planned building. Well of course that idea goes right back to the ancient Romans. Um, the Pantheon, as we can see, then to Bramante's Tempietto in the Renaissance, and to something that was never built, but Hawksmoor certainly knew about, which was Wren's design for a mausoleum for Charles I, which was to go at Windsor Castle, but was never built. And in fact, the more I think about it, the more I think that that is really where the design for the Radcliffe camera comes from. But before the Radcliffe camera, as we know it, was built, um, Hawksmoor actually did a model, which is amazingly interesting um, uh, piece of craftsmanship in itself, for um, a, well, he didn't make it, it was made by an uncle, John Smallwell. Um, but um, uh, this is what Hawksmoor wanted to build right next to the south side of the school's quadrangle. And had it been built, it would have been a very noble, if rather heavy looking building, because heaviness is certainly a characteristic of a lot of Hawksmoor's architecture. Well, in the end, Hawksmoor died, so he couldn't build it. So um, the university instead approached um, James Gibbs, who um, is a very interesting and highly able, accomplished, and in many cases, brilliant architect, who um, had actually already designed the Senate House for Cambridge University, which is still in use, of course. And he 
um, produced a design for a new library, which would have virtually taken up the whole space of what we know, now call Radcliffe Square. Had it been built, it would have been a very noble building. There's James Gibbs's bust on the right, by the way. But um, you can't help um, thinking it fortunate that it wasn't built because um, we wouldn't then have had Radcliffe Square as we understand it. So the um, trustees of the um, Radcliffe bequest said, no, that's very nice, but we don't want that. We want a building more like Hawksmoor's building. We want a building with a dome. So that is, here is um, Gibbs's first design for a domed building um, on the left. Um, it was going to have a stone dome. And the lower parts, as you can see from the bottom right image, are very much like the architecture of the Italian Renaissance, which Gibbs had studied at first hand because he learned his architecture in Rome. Um, he went there to study to be a priest. He was a Roman Catholic and decided he preferred to be an architect. Um, and um, so he um, knew these buildings at first hand. Well, um, this is a cross section of what his stone domed Radcliffe camera would have looked like. And here on the right, in the garden of St Giles House, belonging to St John's now, um, you can actually see a model of it. Oddly enough, nobody has ever found out who made the model. Um, but um, whoever did do it um, was a great service because it gives you an idea of what um, Gibbs originally wanted. It's now on top of a summer house. So in the end, the university said, no, don't build a stone dome um, because um, it's going to be too heavy. It might collapse. We don't quite, can't trust it. Build a timber one instead. That's held up building for a year. Um, Gibbs, um, being a good architect, said, well, I'm not going to throw up that commission. Um, I'm going to do what they want me to do. Um, and here's his timber dome um, with a cross section, as we see there. And here is this wonderful building, um, as it still is, um, beautifully preserved. Um, although I should say that the stonework, like most of the buildings we've looked at, um, got in a very bad state in the late 18th and 19th centuries and has had to be replaced. Um, it was Headington stone, um, which unfortunately didn't stand up well to either time or smoke pollution. Um, and was replaced by um, Burford and Tainton stone, although the lower floor um, is what's called Headington hard stone, which has lasted a lot better. So that's the Radcliffe camera as we know it today. And here, the interior, which was originally open to the public. Um, the gates were shut at night to, present, to prevent rogues from going in there, as um, was said at the time. That was eventually filled in when um, the building was taken over um, by the library by the Bodleian Library. And that incidentally in the middle of the 19th century is why it's called the Radcliffe Camera. It was originally the Radcliffe Library. It became the Radcliffe Room or Camera of the University, as indeed it still is, now holds the History Faculty Library. Um, if you get a chance to go in, that stone vault of the ground floor is very fine indeed, as is the staircase leading up to the room that we see here, um, where in its original form, it was empty. Not many people used the library originally. They didn't even buy any books for a whole year. And it was only when it was taken over by the Bodleian that it had um, a proper and regular use. On the left, you can see um, the posthumous statue of Dr. Radcliffe over the entrance. And here we have the, um, the dome um, looking up. And just to finish, um, I should um, remind you that um, the buildings of the Bodleian didn't stop 
um, in the 18th century with the right of camera because books were accumulated. Um, the university wisely, in my view, but not everybody would agree probably, decided to stay on the central site and not to migrate um, somewhere else as happened at another well-known English university. Um, and so we have the new Bodleian. Not an easy commission. Um, Giles Gilbert Scott was the grandson of the great Victorian architecture, architect George Gilbert Scott, a highly accomplished architect, designed inter alia Battersea Power Station and the Red Telephone Box, plus much else. Um, and he had to basically put a stone cladding around a steel framed building, which went, of course, below ground. And the, the image below shows that steel framing and then he had to produce an outside that would somehow match the rest of the university. Opinions have always differed about how successful he was at doing that um, and they still differ I suspect but I think we are perhaps a little bit kinder um, to the new Bodleian now since the um, coming of the Western Library, which has created a beautiful um, and much used public space inside that building, has given the whole thing an uplift, um, especially with an entrance um, from Broad Street. Um, and uh, I think in its way, this um, deserves, along with the other buildings, um, we've looked at to rank among the great architectural achievements um, of Oxford University. And I've been told to talk for three quarters of an hour. I have talked for three quarters of an hour. So um, I'd like to stop now and thank you for your attention. And I'll be very happy to try and answer any questions you might have.